Okay. Welcome back to Bookworm Games, episode 25, conversation with Patrick Ward. Hi. Hi, Wes. How are you doing? I'm doing just fine. How are you? Right. I'm good. I'm good. We'll pick up. Well, uh, we'll begin at the beginning then. Um, we briefly were talking last night, and maybe you can tell the listeners the context there. Again, it was the wild things. All so. right. Yeah, so I was putting my son to bed, yeah. reading Where the Wild Things Are, which is a great book that I apparently didn't remember from my childhood, but picked up again. And uh, What's the best part about it? I remember when I was younger, the, Where the Wild Things Are had really good images of, of what a wild thing would be. Yeah. The pictures of the half a dozen different wild things are really good yeah. but and so now that i'm an adult uh they still look really wild i think that's the the, the image the archetypal wild thing is the best part yeah about those what the the three pages in the middle where they dance the wild rumpus yes the wild rumpus yeah it, that's the part that uh, I think the words have stuck with me more than the pictures, but the words wild rumpus, uh, I think that's... Yeah, Max the player let the wild rumpus start. And yes. as a grown-up reading a book to a one-year-old, <laughs> I mean, you you really, it opens the floor to whatever you want to do right there. You can either page <laughs> through and the kid won't know the difference, or you right. can describe what they're doing on the pages, or you can kind of let your mild... your let your imagination go wild. Yes. And kind of just did say you, whatever you want to say. Uh, did you and Marianne take turns reading or was she like doing other stuff while you read the book? She she was ready to come in from the wings as I was finished with that one to oh, okay. finish putting him to sleep. Okay. Team up on that. <laughs> yeah. She usually takes the, the lion's share of the responsibility with that, but he likes it when I read him a book, so. Well, I think it's like the, uh, you know, so you got the wild rumpus and, and all that stuff going on. But then at the end of the book, this is the part I didn't remember. You said it ends with him uh, smelling the um, the soup still in his room or, or something, his supper. Is yeah, that he, he kind of, for some reason, gets the sense that he wanted to be where somebody loved him the best, uh. which it seems like he's in that world that he created for himself, but it's maybe he realizes that it's kind of a false love that the wild things have for him as the king of the wild things. Like they so eat. Right. He, he stares into their eyes and, and that scares them. And they recognize <laughs> that as, as the trick that will establish him as the king of the wild things. But then later on That's... after the rumpus, he, he starts to get the sense that he wants somebody else to love him maybe in a more genuine way. And then oh, it's, that, it's then when he smells his supper from across the sea, across the world. And then he kind of goes, he comes out of his imaginary world and goes back right. to his room where his supper is still hot. So it's, uh, it's, I think that's pretty, that's pretty germane to where I'm at right now with uh, Earthbound, actually, because Ness, where we left off, he's, uh, he's in a, a world of his mind's uh, creation his, his it's sort of his um his dream or his um his imagination and uh and this next episode we're gonna uh see how he returns to to the waking world to real life at the end of that so that's pretty cool huh. um yeah so look at look for that um but you also i just saw that you you got a chance to listen to the uh the conversation with uh, Steve Abel that I, I, did I did a while ago. What did you think? I thought it was pretty good. I thought I've I've known Steve for a number of years and played some video games with him and and his style of his style is somewhat what you might say like a like a trash talk <laughs> <laughs> because usually I, we we played a lot of Mario Kart Double Dash for the Nintendo oh, nice. Wii. He and I. Um, that's so that's kind of where I enter the conversation. Steve seemed to be on his best behavior for that conversation. So I know. Well, he's he's a very well spoken and uh, courteous young man. Yes. Um, he, he's also a lawyer now. So I mean, he's come a long way, I'm sure, since your days in the shop, yeah. playing double dash and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, he's well spoken. 
Yeah. Well, okay. Well, so uh, you you are pretty responsible uh, for getting this podcast started. As I, I think I mentioned in one of the first episodes, I, I mentioned that you had uh, encouraged me to start making the podcast after you were listening to a TED Talk uh, about a guy who takes cold showers. Okay. Something like that. Yeah, so yeah. What, can you start the scene there again for, yeah, for everybody? That's, that's kind of where our conversation broke up yesterday. Yeah, um, yeah. So pretty much I had been at, at like a – it was a thing for a, a Catholic church for Lent. It was kind of – they got a bunch of people uh. together and to get everybody in the mindset and the mind frame for, for Lent and what Lent is all about, um, which was actually a, a really enriching thing to go to. Um, yeah. And it, it, it opened the door for myself to do the, the 40 day cold showers challenge because they had, they had a Ted talk that they showed to everybody. Um, and it was kind of like, get yourself psyched to do something difficult, which is what yeah. Lent is kind of part of about. Um, so yeah, this, this guy would just described his experience with a challenge of taking cold showers for 30 days, having given up hot showers. And it kind of, I think he was trying to get a new job or he was trying to improve his life in some ways. And, and the, the advice to him from some entrepreneur was take cold showers. Anytime you got to do oh. something difficult in your life, just start taking cold showers. Because if you can do that, you can, like, you just turn straight cold. No, no tempering at all. Just get in the cold shower and do your business. Like, because <laughs> that, that, if you can do that for yourself then maybe you can think about doing it when other people are on the line. Like if you have to be responsible yeah. making decisions for other people, like that's, hmm. uh, there's, there's more gravity to it. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, I, t I had listened to that and told you that I was taking cold showers for Lent and, yeah. and yeah. you, you'd been talking about doing a podcast. I said, well, just go do it. And I think we made a right. some kind. If you, you said yeah. you're going to do it on some day of the week and if you, yeah, yeah. I forget what the bet was, but you did. I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully it's, um, it's moot at this point. Cause yeah, I haven't done it every single week, but just about. And, um, I, I, I don't know about the cold shower thing. Um, I think I get the gist of it. It's like a mind over matter thing. It's the, uh, the the no tempering of the cold that that i can't i don't think i could do that i don't know i haven't you, tried you can i i think that anybody who can do anything can do that oh all right like the people you mentioned in the podcast the, something about some video game titanic uh -huh. imagine the people in the the titanic who fell in the, the cold icy ocean waters and some of whom survived and some didn't yeah put yourself out yeah. there and swim yeah, it's very different, I guess, making it the the voluntary choice, though. Yes. I think that's the thing of it. Um, that well, seems important. Yeah. It's it's extremely important. I mean, I'm not saying that I always live by it and that I'm capable <laughs> right. more so than not somebody else. But if yeah. if you can do that, then it'll train your brain for, OK, I'm going to get a shock. And yes. Just do it anyway. So, yeah, it's uh starting a new project uh i don't know having a child getting married all of these sorts of um shocking experiences back in the day these were the sorts of things that you would uh you would have some kind of like initiation ceremony that goes along with it and with marriage we've still got that i mean the ceremony is a kind of uh um, in most most cases it's got a religious or at least a uh, community kind of gathering element to it um, but we don't, we don't necessarily do that so much with other things anymore, um, where they would normally, where they would normally fit in. Um, I, I know like one, one ceremony that we have partaken of is, uh, graduation. Like we went to the same school, mm -hmm. uh, back in Gaithersburg, Gaithersburg high school. There you go. Um, yeah. And, uh, I remember, um, getting all dressed up in the robes for that and like wearing the special, like, you know, the hat, uh, the mortarboard, right. And you get to throw it up in the air and that sort of thing. But e even that, I guess has, um, 
become a little less it has lost some of its uh i don't know mis mystery or, or like um emotional weight i guess um i don't know what do you think as, as you've thought about this now that you've got a son like what are some of the the kinds of rites of passage that you uh look forward to guiding him through in in his life um i so this year i bought a 2003 Dodge Ram 1500 that needs right. more work done to it than is worth it. <laughs> My wife will tell you all about how terrible that is, but I can imagine uh, I I want to work on that truck with my son as he grows yeah. older, and I have another son on the way too. So that's oh yeah, that's right, like a father son kind of project that I'm I'm thinking about. And in my mind, I I recently have started to listen to country music, which is like <laughs> pop country. It's kind of uh, I don't know what the right word to describe it. It's kind of uh, It's kind yeah. of like a lame form of musicality that it's, it's, it's all played uh, out. It's all about trucks and mud on your tires. and It's like, cliche, even, right? Cliche I mean, is the word. There you go. Yeah. But it's anyway, all right. It, even, even with that, it still, it still kind of plays to a certain part of your brain that, that kind of identifies with those experiences. Oh, totally. Yeah. Music is a great example. Um, but I was, and, and so, so I was thinking but, about doing that and, and having my son take the truck that we've been working on to like the prom or something like that, <laughs> have, have him in my mind's eye. That's what he's playing with. And, you know, I never had a cool truck when I was younger. So I, I want him to. Have <laughs> that's that's yes. what I'm thinking about. But what you talk about ceremonies, there's there's a baptism mm -hmm. for when uh, of course. a child. That's and that's one thing that religion has. Mm -hmm. I say religion. That's maybe a, a hot button word, but that's the purpose of religions is to, to kind of ceremonialize yes. the things. It's like, absolutely. And so the graduation may be a little bit uh, watered down is that, that yeah. kind of, that's kind of the sense I think I'm getting from you. There's yeah. everybody, everybody gets a trophy. Everybody. Uh, that's what I was graduated. thinking about too. Everybody yeah. goes to college. Everybody oh. wants to go to grad school. But it's, I, it's, I don't. It's kind of the flip side of um, yeah. The the democratization of of education is a good thing, but the flip side of it is that things that became uh, things that were very very special and rare accomplishments, uh, yeah, get sort of um, uh, diminished as they become more um more of a mass kind of thing rather than a, a few yeah a few people getting, yeah yeah but that's mm, so the uh, here's the example i was gonna i was gonna bring up uh some point i don't know if this was while you were in college or after but you went on a uh, a big road trip um yeah I guess it would have been with a different car was that the car that just died that was the car that just died Oh, and no. I totally so, unceremoniously turned her in as a trade-in for the next car. It, yeah. it even struck me as I was doing it that yeah, this is just total lack of ceremony. Here's the here's the title. <laughs> See you later. I'm trying to go to sleep. You know. It was a, that's but yes, that's that thing. Car, I for Valerie. That was the 2004 Malibu Classic. And yeah. It took me 165,000 miles. Yeah, so what what prompted you to go on this this road trip and what sort what sort of memories stick with you from it um now looking back so that was kind of a turning point in my life yeah. where i i had been working one job but i was transitioning to a new job which has since become kind of my career and i knew that it was going to be you know an all in type of deal for the next you know several years so I, I told the people when I was starting the new job, I couldn't start until the end of summer because it was going to take me, you know, I had to drive to California and back. And I was going through a relationship transition, you know, a breakup and kind of trying to figure things out. So I drove to 
uh, first to New England, then through Nebraska and Colorado and California and Texas and North Carolina and back to Maryland and kind of, you know, just saw the country. That's like, that's another country song type of thing where you, you think about, <laughs> okay, you just travel, travel the country, see what, what there is to see and have some experiences. And I thought to myself that I would establish for myself, what's my, what's my spirit? What's my, just my spirit animal was what I was looking for. Uh huh. Um, and I ended up taking a lot of pictures of sculptures of all different things like moose and eagles and dinosaurs and just things that I happened to see just that were right on the road. Uh huh. Yeah. There's, in fact, there's, what's the sculptor's name? There was a guy that I had seen pictures of, like his work online. It was an artist that made sculptures of animals out of stainless steel bumpers from cars. He was in Crested Butte, um, Colorado. What was his name? It uh, escapes me at the moment. But So I never actually made it there. I remember being in the, up in the top of this mountain and trying to like find this guy's uh, like workshop. Oh, man. And so I, I came like probably 10 miles with him. Yeah. I've had a lead from somebody in the town that I was talking to. Uh-huh. And they, they kind of pointed me in a direction. And I said, no, nah, I don't know. It's, it's kind of weird. I'm unannounced. I don't really know anything about this guy. Can I just show up at his shop or like? And so I, I just kept going. I passed through. But then I, I met somebody, in, I think, in California when I finally got there and, and told them about this quest to see this sculptor who made these amazing sculptures because I'm kind of a metal worker. I kind of, I like welding and oh, yeah. fashioning things. Um, and I told this random person in California about that, who was from Colorado and said, yeah, he, he totally would have received you and like showed you around and you could have. And I was like, man, I missed my shot. Yeah. That was, so that was one thing. That was one quest that I don't know if how that relates back to Earthbound. If there's anything, I think it, that, it, it the archetypal hard. adventure story can can read into my story. For sure. Well, I think it's uh, it's very interesting that you got so close to meeting the person face to face, and then only later realized that uh, you know you really you really could have. And it would have been fine, according to yeah. this, you know, stranger in California. Yeah, who knows? That, that, that I think that strikes home to me. Like growing up, I feel like a lot of my memories are of things that I didn't do. If that makes sense, you know, like mm-hmm. yeah. um, being just sort of going through the motions and kind of getting through school and and doing, you know, sports and what whatnot, like all sorts of fun stuff. You know, playing video games. But also, uh, you know, it's like there's so many more things when you look back that, you know, geez, could have done like, yeah, could have done so much more. So like, well, think... here's one, hmm? one, one quick example. Um, uh, back in, uh, I don't know, fifth or sixth grade when they were uh, trying to get people to be um, school bus um, safety patrol Patrols? officers. Patrols? Do you remember? Yeah. That? I yeah, do. Patrols. And and I think you you went through the process and I was like I started the process but then I was like no I don't want to do this and I, <laughs> and I quit the process of becoming a patrol and I I still think that I was like such you a you know what I I did it I got my blue badge and I was you know I was so happy and then I realized <laughs> this is a sham man I'm just a like a a piece of the system now. <laughs> And it doesn't mean anything for real. It's just a, no, so I turned it in. I was only a patrol for like a couple months, I think. Oh man. Yeah. Well, I feel like it, it does. <laughs> I think it does. And you know what you did do though, I remember huh? we had like the great books. Program, yeah. Which we may have talked about this before, but they they had us. What was it like second or third grade? Something fourth grade <sighs> might have been fourth grade. Fourth, yeah. They had us do like a once a month or a once a week. It was like a great book seminar during recess. Yeah, yeah. And you and all the other smart kids, you know, read the books and, and talked about them and did the thing. I think I went to one meeting of that. I, I, <laughs> I want to play. I want to go outside. After yeah. The reading, you know, as much as I understand how, how important reading and literature is. 
Oh, I mean, you know, I think that go play, man. Playing at that age certainly, and maybe in in general, is is at least as important. And if if work, if if reading is simply like work and and being forced to do it, then it's and it doesn't have that element of play to it. Then I, I don't think it's particularly good use of time. Yeah. Anyhow, but one other thing uh, that makes me think of: Do you remember when we would? Um, get together and write stories on the computer uh with like ronnie and uh billy enzer uh-huh. and this yeah. was at the uh, this was at the the substitute school when they were rebuilding Ro- uh rosemont Grosner. Grosner. and it was called grosner yeah grosner and so we would like hang out in the hallway and write these stories on the computer and those the stories were always about um uh zelda and and video games and uh and they were like adventures that that link would go on um with his with his companions um i i think and that the dot matrix uh, printer didn't yeah yeah, yeah. In, like colored type yeah yeah you could you could change the you could change the pictures that went with your your words i don't know if you could change the font but the font was really cool i remember thinking yeah courier <laughs> yeah so, so there you go. Yeah. And so the, those kind of projects, I think, were really valuable. Um, you know, like, I really wish that I could find uh, one of those old printouts of that stuff. If you have any of those, you gotta, you got to send those along. You know what? I, I do have a similar file that I've been keeping with me. Similar to, so I did listen to, I, I was able to listen to the, the Steve Abel conversation, which, let me just say as an aside, I'm... I'm glad that I'm on the podcast, but I'm not as glad that Steve was before me. <laughs> but I'm glad that also that you made the rule where only you can only come one time on the podcast. Yes. So we can just, yeah. our conversations obviously can be better than yours with Steve. So <laughs> we will have the best conversation. Um, so that aside, I remember that like like Steve was talking about keeping like a, a locker, like a foot locker of old video games in a storage unit for $50 a month. Uh-huh. I've been keeping a file of our little stories that we wrote. It was you and me and Ryan O'Connor. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, there was like a pickle emporium and we started to write the video game called The Adventures of Etc. When Ryan <laughs> was learning Java. Oh, yeah. Video game, yeah. And I think it was loosely modeled on the, the, the archetypal RPG story, like the epic story. Yeah. We never, I don't know if we, how far we got with that, but yeah, I do have that file and I will, I'll send it to you. Oh, far out. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you, you at least, you know, are on the show before Ryan, uh, who's, who's got an invite, you know, he's working on making some time, I think. Um, I'm sure. But yeah. Because he he played Earthbound more than I did. I I think I only got through the first, the first yeah. world. I th- I don't think I got to Tucson. That that's interesting to me. Yeah, because like you you had older sisters I growing did. up. Um, I had a younger brother, but older older neighbors and friends who yeah. played a lot of video games. That's kind of how I got into it. And Steve had an older brother play a lot of video games and uh, and soccer. And then um, Ryan is an only child. And so that's something I was going to talk to him about, actually, was like what that's what that was like and how he got into video games. Because because for me, it was always from basically like older uh, brother type figures, you know, yeah. uh, if not an older, an actual older sibling. But so with uh, you guys, you and Amy and Sally Ward would play a lot of uh, like Mario World, right? And stuff like that. Yeah, that was from the Wells' influence, actually. The Wells's, oh yeah, well, yeah. Awesome. I remember playing Sega Genesis with Steven. <laughs> I, have, I have tried to find. It's not Street Fighter, but it's some similar game where Virtua Fighter. I don't know. It was like it was a, it was a couple of dudes who were like big and muscly, and they would walk from left to right, and they were back. <laughs> oh, Double Dragon, maybe. It was. It was Double... a really good game that I played with. Steven well. Anyway. It but could be any of the that above. It was my initiation into video games, which is something that I was thinking about. Where uh-huh. I'm, I'm, I was always more of the action adventure, like move around and do stuff, like physical stuff type of game. Yeah. I didn't know about RPGs until 
I think you, and I, I guess you introduced me to it. Probably. You guys played FF7 and, you know, right. Earthbound. And, uh, yeah, so you got, you got it, like, kind of late in the game, and it makes sense that you didn't get as into it. Um, and I, I do have makes a, a difference. A of, I, I feel like it was my eighth birthday, but I forget if it was, but there was a birthday when I really wanted a Super NES. Uh -huh. And I think that I, that I thought that I didn't get it, and I was really emotional about it. Because mm. I, I guess now thinking about it, there was something that you guys were doing, but I didn't have it at my house. So I couldn't, uh, I couldn't play along, you know? Right. It was almost like, uh, like you and I were talking about last night, about we don't have internet at my house. Right. Our new house yet. And so it's almost like you don't have access to socializing. You don't have access to the group. And it's a really detrimental thing. So yeah. I'm glad that I finally got a Super NES. And I, I think I played Super Mario mostly. Yeah, like you mentioned. Like these days, uh, it's mostly having uh, internet and maybe a, a, a phone that can play whatever the cool new game is. It seems to be like uh, generally... Through, through phones. I think the bare minimum is not even an iPhone. You have to have texting. Yeah, that's a... Smartphone yeah, cause... is definitely way better. But if you if you can't text, then you can't play with the kids. The, exactly, the social game of yeah. like yeah, yeah. Being, being connected. Um, okay, so like uh, Earthbound, yeah. But you did get into um, Final Fantasy VIII, right? That was the one that you played a lot of. I, yeah, that was more of my specialty. I think I must have played seven after I played eight. Okay, and what was that's about? Not how it was? It was backwards, but because you guys were telling me, oh, FF seven is way better than eight. I I still think that's that's for me because I, <laughs> I played it first. I don't know, but eight there's like there's some interesting stuff going on in number. Like what 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 appealed to you about FF eight? FF8 was good because it was the game that I had. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 I, that... I mean, I, I just, I, I don't know, I liked it. I, the thing about RPGs that I tended to do, or I guess video games in general, or life in Sorry, what? Could you do like the last 10 seconds of that one more time. Yeah, I got a phone call. Got Sorry, yeah. I was just saying that the way that I kind of operate with video games is just to collect things. So I would uh, collect okay. all the, the magic in Final Fantasy VIII came as like little, um, like little balls or gems or something, and you would have to draw them out of your enemies. And so I would exactly. sit there for hours and hours and draw until each person in the party had 99 of everything. <laughs> right. Like I would sit and level up until people's levels were ridiculous and the boss wasn't difficult. Like that's just kind of how I, how I did in when I played final fantasy seven, I, I leveled up like master level. Gotcha. So that kind of, that kind of mastery. Uh, yeah. I, when see, I played I final see. fantasy tactics. I, I made each character go through every single job. <laughs> <laughs> so Holy like, smokes. Yeah, and so that's kind of just how I played it, which isn't a realistic, and I don't think it's, it's not the way that the game maker intended it either. I don't know. I mean, it's. I think that's kind of like a completionist sort of attitude, um, which is definitely a thing. Yeah. Uh, where it it just takes a lot of time, and I think it does have a more, like you say, you like doing metalworking and stuff. It's like a more. Uh, craftsman like approach to the game maybe and less of a story sort of approach like I, I would yeah. take to it. in fact yeah. most of the time in the games I would just like I would click through the storyline <laughs> that's how I did it <laughs> so this is like how you would spend your time though right like you have so much time to allocate to the game and you know clearly you put a lot into it so you wanted to put that where where you felt it was Best. Yeah, I want the stats. Yeah, you, can, you can see the stats. I have status stats. Yeah, yeah. Knowledge of the context of why we're here. I just know that that's the bad guy. And you can <laughs> have 99 lives or whatever. That's, I mean, that's basically the, the, like, the, stru the underlying structure of the game is just that, right? Like, 
here's your party, this is the enemy. And by becoming uh, more whatever, you know, have, have higher levels, higher stats, like you said, then, then that's how you, you win the game. Like that's what, that's the basic structure of the game in a sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, uh, and the games like, you know, action adventure games and, and like beat em up types of games, uh, Grand Theft Auto, even to an extent, uh-huh. like the, the story is much less uh, foregrounded there. And it's much like, there's much more of a sense of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like click through whatever stuff, like let's get to the actual game. Yeah. Um, it's almost like <laughs> what popped into my head. It's like a, a video pornography where the storyline is just, it's just there <laughs> so that it's believable. What you want right. to do is you want to get to the action. <laughs> I think, you know, that that's a comparison. Uh, the creator of Earthbound, <laughs> he, he goes one further. He goes one further. In some interview, I haven't been able to track down in a long time, but this used to be on someone's website where he interviewed uh, Shigesato Itoi, the, the writer of Earthbound, the creator. And he basically likened a good video game to not a, not a porn video, but an actual prostitute and, and said, Basically, the, the aim of, of video games is to relax the player in the way that a, an encounter with a prostitute would or, or something something along those lines was, was how he put it. And I've always sort of felt that that can't be quite right. Um, I, I, see, I see how there's an element of that, maybe. Like, that is a thing that, that playing video games can do. Um, but it strikes me that they're much more not like pornography or something, but more like opera, uh, at least RPG games. They have, they have so much else going on in them, um, so much more spectacle and so much more uh, uh, music for, for one thing. And, and the visuals are like very cinematic. Yeah. Um, that is, strikes me that- The music in Final Fantasy VII was excellent. Yeah, right. Like it's so super atmospheric and, and cool. Yeah, so, but opera- like just to follow that thought out a little more opera is is like a pretty again like an elite sort of art form it's not something that really appeals to to most people most people are much more down with uh country music or something or something like that yeah um so i don't know like maybe i don't know maybe you're just like more i think it's your eye like I think there are different types of people and you in particular are a person who is able to understand the art form hmm. in kind of a deeper way yeah. and connect it to other sorts of art forms that kind of, it brings out the underlying humanity Yeah, because you're able to do that. But most people probably just click through and they're like, well, okay, let's get to some gameplay. Maybe. I, I don't think, I don't think a lot of people are able, like this podcast is an awesome comment on a lot of different topics yeah well thanks but you have to know a lot about a lot to get and you have to have played earthbound intimately i i guess so yeah i mean i appreciate that i i would like to make i think the particularly the conversations are are ways that i i try to make the podcast have a a a more broad kind of appeal and it's something that i i'd like to do better in the in the lectures as well the, the the ones where i just talk like find ways to draw in more uh, different kinds of people, more people with different backgrounds. And like, I think that's something that, so here's another person that I don't remember if I got you listening to this stuff or you got me on, onto it was Jordan Peterson's uh, podcasts and stuff that he talks about. I think he does a really good job of like talking about stuff in a way that's like accessible uh, to, to the general listener, yeah. right? Like to people who, are not necessarily like deeply versed in a lot of the literature that he talks about. He nevertheless makes it like appealing and, and entertaining. Yeah, I feel like to. I've read you know, the Gulag Archipelago because he's commented <laughs> so many times in his podcasts about what's the what's the gist of it. And yeah, that's probably because he's lived his life as a, a lecturer, and so he's <laughs> he's been able to practice many many times what his message is. Exactly. And able yeah. to distill it to a point where it's reach or it can reach the common person. Yeah. But also like the sometimes what I notice in podcasts is that somebody 
and like the not not you the host maybe i would say why don't we clarify this or somebody would say why don't we clarify the point like let's define what an rpg like a rolling role-playing game versus right. an adventure game like what's what's the distinction there that's for true. the people yeah. that haven't played video games a lot like that's that's how you can yeah me, it's it's a it's a language almost like a, a vocabulary I yeah mean. for time like right. just by listening and i haven't played earthbound but listening to to you talk about it is is a great way to just i don't have to spend the time to to gain the the riches that come out of it you know i just listen to you right well i hope so i mean it's like this is a i think it's also an invitation and i think again that this is something that an effect that um listening to peterson and another podcast that i listen to a lot is the tolkien professor um and then uh, my friend Alex kind of also helped motivate me to like start making podcasts. But I think that's, that's a big part of it too, is like when you do listen to this stuff or you, or you play the game or you, you hear about the thing enough, then it's sort of, I think part of the byproduct of that is that it, it gets you interested in trying out like making one, you know, I don't know. Have you been, have you been thinking about making a podcast of your own at this point or I know we talked a little while ago about um, I, your your Pat your Ampat Corp. I don't know if you talk about yes, that the corporation. Yeah, <laughs> the American Patrick Corporation. Yeah, <laughs> and you have to say the in front of it. The it's the American, American Patrick Corporation. Patrick Cor okay, so tell tell us a little bit about where that stands at this point. Um, that is is slowly plotting, and I think it will come to fruition over time. Okay. Because I realized that it can't be like that. That's kind of the embodiment of a lot of, you know, when you and Ryan O'Connor and I were sitting in, in one of our basements playing <laughs> video games and reading books and like fiddling with, you know, things. Yeah. Scheming. Uh, we had lots of schemes, <laughs> right. And so this is like the embodiment, like the realistic embodiment of yeah. one of those schemes where it's kind of a, it's a social comment at the same time that it's a legitimate corporation. It's like a legitimate umbrella corporation to house my real estate initiatives. All right. Or other, other companies of sub companies, contracting companies, <laughs> which eventually as you, as you grow older, you have to, you know, get out into the world and start producing something right. that's useful to society. And it has to be genuinely useful. So in an artful way, you have to kind of combine what you did as a youngster mm -hmm. with what's actually useful. So one example is the podcast. This is useful to bring people together. It's useful to educate people about different things. Yeah. And it's, it kind of comments on your, your return to your childhood. That's one thing that, yeah. that Jordan Peterson talks about the, the epic tale of adventure is go out into the world and then circle back around, come, come home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's what the video games are for. And this is one of the schemes. So right now my wife and I moved to a new home and we have our old home that we kept as a rental property. And so that's, that's going to eventually all incorporate and, and house that real estate company within the American Patrick Corporation. Right. But also I had had plans or, or thoughts of not doing a podcast, but doing like a, almost like the real world, the real world already did it, but uh, like staging, staging things like a with a GoPro or just whatever camera set. Uh -huh. I think it was like drunk history, <laughs> something similar to that, where somebody will will just get a, like a bottle of whiskey or whatever and start drinking it at the same time that they're telling some they're retelling some historical story. Yeah, and it's really interesting. Eventually, they get drunk enough that it's. Like they're really emphatic about it. <laughs> right. And eventually they get drunk enough that it's hilarious. That's just, and they fall that's over. That's just a fun time it's all a, around. Yeah. It's a combination of the realness that is a history lesson and the hilarity that is the drunkenness. Yeah. And when I say drunkenness, it makes me think of, of Ness. Uh huh. Okay. And I wonder if there's something. Here's, here's another conspiracy theory. If the, the name Ness has anything to do with like that you can put Ness on the end of any 
yeah what adjective or word that's um that's something that uh like was it burkaw who came up with for while he was trying to get that to catch on as a word the nest the nest the nest yeah. yeah yeah see these are the sort of creative things that you know when you're hanging out with your friends whether you're drinking or not you sort of come up with right and like we we used to have a lot of like great discussions amongst our friends um and it comes back to i think like the idea that you you do sort of you not only learn a language but in doing so you you get to sort of create um you make something new whether it's a podcast or just like confabulating you know making up stories and making up words and and thinking about uh, you know scheming about how it would be fun to do this or that yeah i think i think that aspect of it um well for one thing ness as a character he's a kind of uh he doesn't really have a lot of personality of his own at first. And in a way, he's like the thing that you can freely project um, whatever personality you see fit upon, right? He, he sort of yeah. he's a stand in for the, the player, the person imagining the story as they play through. Um, and, and in a way, as you go along, he does start to, to gain a kind of personality. You start to notice little things about like peculiarities where he's different from the other characters who each do sort of have a concrete um, personality set out for them. Um, and so he starts to get sort of more defined as you go along on the journey. Um, things like how he only- he's You've only, already identified with- Yeah, he, well, he, he's- You've already projected yourself. Gets, um, gets homesick, right? So what does that mean? Like he's the one who, as you described, uh, represents that, that desire to return home um and and like if you have projected yourself onto him in that sense what that would mean is that you as the player would want to return you know to your to your home whether that's literally where you're from or just the real world right like come out of the game and return to home being like your actual life your daily life ordinary things yeah yeah so like i i think it's it's definitely interesting because it's it's the suffix of like generality in that way it's like the 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 quality of being attached to something but on the other hand it's this uh this kind of concreteness right like the 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 substance of anything is its ness uh, that's what the burkhaw definition of yeah, ness. yeah yeah right essence the essence of course yeah there's a good there's a good uh scholastic yeah. word for it <laughs> yeah yeah well, so, um, but to, to wrap up, so one of the stories that you wrote at some point when you were doing um, uh, shot put, I believe, or discus or both, uh, yeah. you wrote a story, yeah. what was the character's name who spins and wins? I, I forget. I don't know. I, oh, you mean the, the dude, his name was Dooley. Dooley. Yeah, yeah, Dooley. Tell, tell, Dooley. Could you tell the story of Dooley? I know you're, well, I assume that you're not drinking right now, but in your best in your best storytelling mode, uh, tell, tell the story of Dooley. So Chris Dooley. Chris Dooley was like, maybe he's almost the the thing that American Patrick seeks to be. Ah. I don't know. Maybe that's, that's, too much of, that's too much pressure for him. But American Patrick is at the same time a, like a lovable idiot country song mm. character. Mm. And he's also something that you kind of look at and kind of scoff at. Yeah. So that's to, to wrap up what American Patrick Corporation is. It's the it's the vehicle that houses the character that is American Patrick. Uh -huh. And yes, he has my same uh, given name. <laughs> I don't think that I'm the best American Patrick, but I'll do the best shot I can. Right on. But so he seeks to be an idiot that everybody can love and pay money to get his baseball cap. <laughs> and also you know take over the world secretly using like the the structure of of laws and finance and stuff like that and for the intellectual people they can notice that american patrick is kind of doing stupid things that everybody loves but it's really dumb so it's that it's the dichotomy between like the intellectual side and the the regular person regular joe uh, yeah bridging but, so, chris, Dooley, chris Dooley was a smart guy but he came out as as a shot putter he was a big 
a big, heavy, muscly. I think he played linebacker, or maybe he was a lineman on the football team at Gaithersburg High School. Makes sense. And he could be listening. Who knows? What's up, Chris? If you're out there. <laughs> but uh, so he was he was a shot putter. He taught me to to throw shot put and throw discus. Uh, and I I guess I was looking up to him as as a high schooler. I think I was a, a freshman or sophomore, uh-huh. and he was a senior. But just him spinning, the way you you know you spin, you kind of you take your two steps and you spin. I yeah. put. I was thinking about that as I was walking home through a field. It must have been sophomore year because I didn't have a car. And there was a flock of geese in this big field that I had to walk through, like Canada geese with all the poop everywhere. And just imagining, maybe imagining myself as that spinning and whirling, and the geese flying up around me like a like a tornado kind of kind of deal and i i think i wrote a poem like you're talking about it, it was yes some kind of poetic work that i've lost touch with i don't know if you remember i don't remember distinctly i i couldn't remember the character's name for one thing but i do remember the line about spinning and winning and you, you spinning used, and winning. you'd use that and you kind of built a repetition thing out of it that was really quite effective i thought and, and the um the image the, of the geese, that's really cool because they're, you know, they migrate, they go out and they return. And that's that's kind of an image of spinning as well. And and why do they do that? It's it's for the 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 continuance of their 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 flock, you know? It's like that's that's how the next generation comes in and and, and flies with the with the parents. It's so there's something I think pretty pretty deep there actually. Um, but um, I do hope that that old Dooley is uh, is listening. <laughs> you know, the American Patricks out there are listening yeah. and are inspired uh, to take to take their place in the in the flying V. Um, yeah, I think that's to kind of sum up what we were talking about earlier about the things that we didn't do. Yeah, and then the things that I encourage you to do. Yeah, you know, make your podcast. Oh. You know. Do do your project, whatever it is. Just go out and do it. Jump in, you know? yeah. I love it. I love it. And and the thing about the spinning too, the uh, when you do the shot put or the discus, you have that like there's a, a circle around you that you got to stay within, right? Um, mm-hmm. And and like the long jump, I remember when I would do the long jump, I thought a lot about you know there's that line you can get as close as possible to the line, but you can't step over it or it's a foul. Um, yeah, validated. You gotta, you've gotta stay within, and I think there's something to that as well. This this idea of 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 the limits or the rules of the game, the 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 circle that you stay within for it to for it to work, and describing American yeah. Patrick using using laws and using uh, very subtle understanding of of human nature and and so, sort of that sort of thing to uh, yeah it, win and win. And I was thinking about another thing, not to start another conversation, but the limit, there's a limit, like the extent to which a video game can represent reality. Oh, yeah. The limit is being pushed, Mm -hmm. which when you see the old games with like a 32-bit or a 64-bit computer console, it, it seems really primitive by today's standards because we're pushing the limit with our technology. Ah, Um, and and the intent is always to represent something that seems believable to the the game player, something that that looks like reality, and you can experience in a way that registers with your natural born brain. Yeah. So you kind so of you lose yourself the, in it. Yeah, in the same way that a novel seeks to describe something that's true. Yeah. Like uh, something else that Jordan Peterson talks about is. Um, a, a, like a, a real story is real, but if you have like like I keep saying the word archetypal story, mm-hmm. it's it's almost more than real because it it has all the parts that anybody could identify with, mm-hmm. and so you try to to draw out not just one story but any story. It's like every story. Yes, it's the shape or the form of that story, if you like. Yeah. Which is so. There's something that a video game. You can start at the beginning 
and and to me it's kind of limited because it always ends at the end yeah like there's a, a general path that you can kind of deviate and you can have side quests and stuff but it's mainly there's a story there's one story mm. where we've we've pushed the limit on that too with other video games that kind of let you do whatever you want to in the world like you go out it's like a like a what is it, second life or sandbox games know. yeah you, you get to I've kind, kind of, of work freely game. within it yeah, yeah. Um, well, no but uh that i think that is an interesting uh sort of conundrum though it's like if the game becomes too real then you get to this kind of like thought experiment of of the matrix situation yeah, right where like the matrix. You, you know or or uh, what's the newer thing now um, with, uh, with the kid who plays the game so well that he wins and saves the universe kind of thing. Ender's I don't remember. Game. There's Ender's Game. Yeah, that's right. There's that one. Um, there's even a new one out now. Uh, ah, anyway, but so it's, it's a Spielberg movie that just came out. Um, Ready, Ready Player One. That's it. That's it. But it's almost like it's the, the games are trying to like live life for people and i almost feel like i i've pulled away I, like steve abel i have a pile of video games that i haven't set up yet and i carry them i carried them to the new house i didn't even uh -huh. when i moved to the old house i didn't set up the video game console because i was doing stuff you know i was having a family and things so i wonder if like if you push it to the limit you have to go out and, and live the video game you have to live the, the archetypal story. You have to go do, make your podcast. Right on. You know? And so that's kind right. of the thing. Like, uh, like my son, I want him to go do, go do things. And I'll teach him to play video games. And I'm going to set up, I have a, a curved CRT TV that I'm going to get duck hunt and a gun. <laughs> and i'm going to teach him to play video games but at the same time you can spend all your time inside just like your earthbound earthbound dad would tell you exactly exactly well i think on that we'll 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 call this the limit of the conversation and get back to yard work and yep. you know doing that stuff that you do. <laughs> <laughs> well thanks again pat for your time uh really enjoyed getting to talk to you here and Gave me a lot of food for thought. Um, yeah. So yeah, I appreciate you take, taking time and with me. Say hi to the folks and, and everybody back there in Maryland. And I hope to see you again before too long. Okay. All right. Enjoy your time. Thanks a lot, Wes. All right. Bye. The podcast you just heard was published with Anchor. Got something you want to say to the creator of this show? Send them a voice message using the Anchor app free for iOS and Android.